Good afternoon, everyone. Today is Thursday, June 9th, and I'm Caroline Bailey, a Professional Development Coordinator for the Developmental Disabilities Administration. We welcome you to the second session of our LTSS Maryland Lunch and Learn series. Today's session is called You're Not In It Alone, Resources to Support Transition Readiness. Our presenters today are Leslie Suziak, BDA Statewide Director of Provider Services, Onesta Duke, Regional Director for our Southern Maryland Region, Kathy Marshall, Regional Director for our Western Maryland Region, and Bianca Renwick, Regional Director for our Central Maryland Region. We also have Brianna Shaughnessy from the Medicaid Provider Services team, and Nicolette Perpodamas from our Central Maryland Regional Office. Lastly, we have Patricia Sosoki serving as a panelist, and Andrea Jones as a moderator. Before we begin, I would like to go over a few things about the webinar. All participants are in listen-only mode. There are two options for listening to the webinar, by computer and by phone. If you are having trouble hearing, you may try switching your audio by selecting the other audio option on the webinar panel. There is one handout for this webinar, which can be found in the handout section of your control panel. And we will be taking breaks to answer questions throughout the presentation. So please enter any questions you may have into the question box on your webinar panel. The presentation will be recorded and will be available on DDA's LTSS Maryland webpage. Now, I would like to turn it over to Leslie Suziak. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm looking forward to another great session. Um, as Caroline said, I am the Statewide Director for Provider Services with DDA, um, and we would like to talk to you today about the resources that we have put in place um, to support transition readiness into the LTSS Maryland um, DDA module. Next slide, please. Here is just a brief agenda of what we're going to be going over. Um, DDA activities to support the go live effort. Um, also, the coordinator of community services PCP readiness component. Um, we've got some most common post go live exceptions we'd like to talk with you about. And then also some go live best practices um, that we've we've determined over over the course of several months. Um, so why don't we jump right in um, next? slide please we can move into the next one also so to support the the dda's transition from pcis2 to ltss maryland dda module we worked in partnership with our early adopters to create a self-assessment that would support providers in being able to determine their readiness for fee-for-service billing and, and you know, also to help reduce potential service disruptions. So that self-assessment is really based on nine critical readiness areas. Um, we have them listed out here for you below. Um, we look at the medical assistance number, base, and each um, uh, additional site MA number, um, the categories of service or the, the COS codes in LTSS Maryland. We look at the um, electronic fund transfer payments, person-centered plan review, dedicated hours, community living group home and supported living configurations, location billing turn on. Um, we review LTSS Maryland training needs. And then we also um, have providers self-assess their internal structure preparation for transition. Next slide. So that's a lot that I, I just threw at you. Um, so we're gonna break that down a little bit more. Um, as part of this effort to help providers get ready, we developed work stream groups to look at various areas of readiness. And, and for today's purposes, we're gonna look at two main categories. So we have our provider readiness work stream group, and then we also have a PCP um, readiness group as well. Um, First, we're gonna talk about the provider readiness work stream. So you can see on the slide here what that, or who that group consists of. So from HQ DDA offices, um, it has, we have our L DDA LTSS Maryland program manager, um, myself, the statewide director of provider services. Then we also have regional office representatives. So CCS, CCS support services, provider services, and then um, deputy directors. In addition to that, we work very, very closely with Medicaid Provider Services or MPS. So on our group, we also have 
their director, um, and then their health group of health policy analysts. So we can all work in tandem as, as we look at items. So really there are three main goals of this work stream group. So one is to track the critical readiness areas for each provider that's going live. And we sort of use a, a stoplight approach to tracking that readiness and then also to triage support needs to meet the go live date. Um, we also look at technical assistance for providers going live. And then lastly, um, as part of that, that, that coordination, you know, we have internal um, Maryland Department of Health coordination to support the go live by tracking and trending any technical assistance issue that may arise. Um, and that would be TOLU that handles a, 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 the good portion of that and then the, the program manager. And then also we liaise with LTSS Maryland contracted developer to discuss any development that might be needed uh, moving forward. Next slide, please. So breaking down a little bit more of what we do in this work group. So we have this wonderful tracker that we use and we review a variety of things. So again, going back to those key critical readiness items that we analyze and track as part of this group. So we look at each provider that go, that's going live, we look at their MA site numbers, we look at the addresses to make sure those are correct. We look at site configurations for all community living group homes. Additionally, we do the same thing for site locations. So any other site MA that a provider might have. We review all of the billing codes to make sure those are correct. And then we also look at the other billing. So when, or when I say we look at the billing codes that are attached, we're talking about the services that are being provided. So if it's DAHAB, making sure the correct codes are attached. If it's a community living group home, making sure the correct um, billing codes are attached. Then we also review for, for other billing codes as appropriate. So, you know, if it needs to have a respite daily or the 2T code applied um, for youth under 18 um, or the community living group home enhanced codes. Um, those are all things we look at in addition. And then we also, um, then lastly, very lastly, we turn on the providers for billing for each service once we know all of those critical pieces are in place. Next slide. And I wanted to just share with you um, just kind of a, a, a simple visual of, of what this, this tracker tells us. So we're able to break the data down by region um, and, and look at things from a percentage, percentage perspective. Um, green means the task has been completed and you'll see 100%. Yellow, the yellow orange color indicates that the item is in progress. So let's say, um, a billing code needs to be added to a specific MA number, and the request has been submitted to myself to do that, um, they, would, they would move it to in progress and it would show up as orange until it's since been added and then they, they can turn it to green. And then red lets us know the item is in jeopardy of not being completed within the specified timeline that we have, we have put forward in order to get everything up and running um, by the time the go live date approaches. Next slide. So I, I stated um, a couple of slides ago that part of this work stream's role is to identify and track any issues that might arise for providers during the go live process. And we also triage those issues at the regional level. So our goal is to really work hand in hand with the providers that are going live if they run into any concerns so we can resolve them as quickly and efficiently as possible. Um, in addition, we're able to then take that information that we've gleaned from anything that's happened or occurred um, and use that to guide providers in later go live groups who may run into you know, similar types of issues. So this visual just kind of demonstrates our, our work stream process as it relates to technical assistance. So the regional office is made aware of the issue by the provider and they enter that into, the, the, the regional office enters that into our, our technical assistance tracking document. It is then determined by DDA and Medicaid provider services whether or not it's a system error. 
If it is a system issue, um, it has then escalated to our DDA LTSS Maryland program manager and Medicaid provider services health policy analyst for resolution. If it's determined not to be a system issue, it's elevated to myself um, to determine appropriate escalation strategies and then we monitor it daily um, until we you know, work through the resolution. And as you can also see, we track the progress of these issues identified through the provider readiness work stream weekly um, at, at a minimum just to ensure that efficient and, and timely resolution to, to issues. Ultimately our goal is to resolve everything we that's possibly possible to resolve at the regional level um, and not have to um, uh, have help desk tickets submitted and you know sometimes that does end up having to happen but if we can if we can you know assist with things at the regional level and the hq level that's what we want to do next slide please so in addition to our provider readiness work stream group we also have a work stream as i mentioned before that focuses on pcp readiness so that group works on things and, and does the following. So active PCP tracking, tracking, they troubleshoot with providers and CCS agencies to meet deadlines for timely service authorizations. And then they also assist providers with working in, who are working in multiple regions through, through one DDA regional office, you know, where applicable for a centralized go live coordination. So to speak a little bit more specifically to that, from a regional perspective, I want to turn it over to Kathy Marshall, the Western Maryland Regional Office Director. Um, she'd really like to speak to how her region has been assisting providers and CCSs um, with this specific process. Kathy? Thank you, Leslie. Good afternoon, everyone. That was a lot of information and a lot of slides. So let's talk about what that really looks like on the regional office level. The active PCP tracking, we have a tracker for every individual that your agency is serving that will be moving into an LTSS for billing. So you're actually, we have a list of names, providers, annual dates, PCP dates that we work our way through. We don't expect any provider agency to go through their plans and do them all in a week. Right now, we're working with providers who are going in on a September 1st date. So that gives us over eight weeks to look at all the PCPs and make sure that the services the individual needs are documented in LTSS and meets the waiver definitions. With the troubleshooting with providers and CCS agencies, we look at a list or a group of individuals we'll do at a time. Maybe your agency has 100 individuals. We're going to look at 20 PCPs this week, 20 next week, 20 the following week. We're not going to say we're going to do all 100 this week. Nobody can do that. And actually, some of your PCPs will not need anything except maybe an updated DSAT. Others are going to need a total overhaul, but we have not really seen that. We've really just seen a revised PCP that has some new components or they need an updated DSAT or uh, the provider implementation plan may look a little different or somebody may need a schedule. The regional office meets weekly with the CCS supervisors. This has just been a wonderful tool. We problem solve together. Agencies share their information about, hey, this worked for me. Why don't you try this? This didn't work or we're having a problem here. Can somebody look at that and tell us why that's going on? And so it really has become very much of a team effort. A lot of information sharing, a lot of best practices going back and forth. If you are providing services, say in Western region, but your headquarters is in Southern or Central, you're not gonna be left behind we have made sure that every provider no matter where they serve in the state that those pcps are marked for that region in order to ensure they're ready for billing um, both the program supervisor tina swank and the deputy director linda yale 
spend a lot of time talking directly to provider agencies, or perhaps it's the person in your agency that's actually working on the PCP with the CCS, there are no silly questions. Every question you ask is important. If you're not sure, that's what we're here for. We're here to help. Before you even get started, the minute that you say, hey, I think I wanna move into LTSS, we look at that readiness survey. We go through that readiness survey with you and we answer any questions we have, but it doesn't stop there. There are periodic check-ins with the providers as we're moving forth. Uh, we had one provider agency who decided that one of the services they wanted to go live, we needed to make that a month later because they didn't feel like their documentation by staff was strong enough. We have a lot of flexibility to meet you where you are and to help you move forward. And then once you're turned on for live billing in LTSS, it doesn't stop there. Uh, we do one or two check-in calls. If there's a problem, we wanna identify it immediately. We had one uh, billing issue and it was actually resolved in less than 72 hours, very quickly. So if you're seeing something, you don't feel good about something, something just isn't making sense, reach out to us because this has become a huge team effort. And for Western, we're at over a third of the individuals who receive services in Western region being billed in LTSS. After our September groups and the groups that are going live July 1, we're gonna be close to 50%. So we really do have some experience. We've all had the hiccups and we have a lot of experiences to share. So just don't forget, reach out to us. Thank you very much, Kathy. Appreciate it. Okay, next that. slide, please. So as with the provider readiness tracker visual that I shared a few slides ago, we wanted to share an example of what this looks like from a PCP tracking perspective um, and, and how we are able to track components of the PCPs and their progress across the regions. So this just shows you an example of that targeted technical assistance and it, it you know, really allows us to prioritize our actions. Next slide, please. So I'm, I'm gonna throw a little bit more information at you and then we're gonna take a breather to see if there are any questions. So um, in addition to everything we've just talked about, um, we also really, the, the, the regional offices have offered a great deal of support, you know, across the board as to our go-live providers. Um, and you heard some of the, the great things that Western has been doing. Um, so each regional office has been providing technical support weekly and as needed to the providers that are going live. And they really work to set up a, you know, kind of a cadence of meetings and communications that are set in partnership with those providers that are, are going live. And, and the, the purpose of those is to support completion of that self-assessment that we talked about at the beginning of the webinar assist with determining the go live scope and timeline and when i say the go live scope i mean you know maybe a provider isn't quite ready to fully jump into ltss maryland dda module with both feet but maybe they want to you know dip a toe or two in the water so maybe they only want to go live with you know a few of their community living group home sites or they only want to do um their day hab services so really figuring out what that would look like. And then also if they wanna split their go live process between you know, two different months. So maybe they wanna do those, those community living group home sites I mentioned on July 1st, and then they wanna add in their day hab um, services on August 1st. So really figuring that out. And then also to, to, to plan and troubleshoot issues you know, as they arise with the executive teams for the providers. Um, so to speak to that a little bit more, I'd like to give the virtual floor um, to Onesta Duke, the Southern Maryland Regional Office um, Director, and also Bianca Renwick from the Central Maryland Regional Office, the Acting Regional Director, to speak on some of the great things that they've been doing to help their providers through this process. So Onesta? Thank you, Leslie. Good afternoon, everyone. So. 
our regional office has been working diligently with our providers and CCS agencies to ensure a timely and successful transition into LTSS for our, the agencies that we're working with. So our preparation started with scoping providers' readiness by engaging them in discussions pertaining to the nine critical areas that were mentioned earlier by Leslie. So it was important for us to gauge where providers were as far as having all of their base and individual site MA numbers, their billing codes, and especially um, checking to see where they were as far, as far as tracking and monitoring PCPs. We were also discussing their internal structure and their preparation for transitioning into LTSS. So um, next, we, we're engaging providers in weekly meetings to help with the coordination of their transition into LTSS. These meetings include key members of the provider's team that are assisting with the transition and typically include the uh, executive directors, program managers that are working directly with the coordinators of community services, agencies, billing staff, IT staff, and more. Um, so it's up to, to the provider to include um, whomever they, they prefer to participate in our weekly meetings. And as far as the regional office, we um, typically include our PS team, our provider services team in, in the meetings, as well as our CCS squad, our fiscal director, um, our deputy, as well as myself. So during these uh, meetings, we're reviewing key elements to a successful transition. Um, and all of these elements are noted in the um, DDA LTSS Maryland um, module playbook and also um, reflected in the provider readiness checklist. Um, we're reviewing and reconfirming the provider's go live date for all services that will be going live in the system. We're also reviewing the LTSS billing training dates and ensuring that um, identified staff that have, um, whether they have registered for the training and, and where they are as far as, um, as participating and so on and so forth. So we're also reviewing um, key DDA resources that were previously shared and can be accessed um, on our DDA website. And some of these resources that we tend to um, review or answer questions on are the um, person-centered plan development and authorization guidance, as well as the guidelines for service authorization and provider billing documentation. Um, and as far as that particular document, we're typically answering and clarifying a lot of questions pertaining to dedicated one-to-one -one supports and the documentation that's typically needed in order to demonstrate and assess need. Um, another important um, element that's covered during those meetings is that we're reviewing and tracking all person-centered plans that will be going live in the system and the status of those um, PCPs. So ahead of the first uh, meeting, we share a spreadsheet with the provider um, of all the PCPs that will be tracked for accuracy and approval. Um, providers are typically, um, are essentially asked to review the tracker and to inform us if there's any, um, if any modifications are needed. Um, and we are also asking providers to add information that will allow our provider services team to update the residential configuration for community living group home um, services. So in addition to the weekly meetings that we're having with the providers, our CCS squad is also meeting weekly with our CCS agencies. And during those meetings, they're discussing the status of the PCPs um, for providers that are transitioning into the system and they're ensuring that the PCPs are moving through the system in a timely manner. And of course, they're troubleshooting any issues that may be occurring um, with with any particular plan. So even after um, providers have transitioned, we are continuing to meet with um, the, 
our providers or agencies that, that um, transitioned into the system just to ensure that everything is going smoothly, that they're not experiencing any um, technical issues in the system. And if they are, we're helping to work them, um, walk them through um, finding a resolution to those issues. So I would say overall, this process has been extremely collaborative and is um, definitely set up to hold um, everyone involved accountable for doing their part. The CCS agencies, the regional offices, our headquarters team, um, the providers, everyone has um, essentially been doing a really great job and has demonstrated a, a great commitment to making sure that um, every task is completed timely. So at this time, I would definitely say we are looking forward to assisting and working with other providers because it's been a really good experience and um, we're very excited to um, continue working with other agencies. That's it. Thank, Thank you, you. Onus. Bianca? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the great thing about being one DDA is that all of our processes are very similar. So in sharing what we do at the Central Maryland Regional Office, um, it, it, I'm just going to add to what Kathy and Onesta already shared. Again, I believe we believe the success of our um, LTSS transitions have been due to the collaboration with our um, partners our providers and our CCSs with their regional office team. We meet on every Friday at about one o'clock. Um, it's very informal where we discuss um, where everyone is, um, any concerns that they have, what's working, what's not. And what we found um, even as our role is to provide the TA support, the providers actually learn from each other, right? So in shared experiences and hey, try this, this may work. No, don't do this this way because this did not work well. And they have actually formed a partnership in this process together with us. And we found that that has proven very effective and it, it has created a really great circle of support for our region. At this Friday meeting, our the coordination agencies are also invited and we use that time to review the list, confirm areas where additional support and information is needed, um, whether it was a missed connection, so they schedule time to follow up after that meeting, or if it's a global issue, utilize that space to discuss um, what the concern is or what the hiccup may be, and then we troubleshoot together. Um, for the providers who have come in each month, we've just added them to the already established group and it has um, served as a comfort for those new providers to hear from the already transitioned providers um, that they have had positive experiences. So it helps alleviate some of the concerns and anxiety that the providers have had going into this new system. So that has worked very well for us. Um, at the region, our team works very closely and communicate internally, um, as Anesta said, to identify those plans that, we're, that we have to get ready to go. We work closely with the CCSs and the providers. What we have done instead of um, assigning particular staff to um, providers, we're utilizing our um, supervisors as that contact and they triage um, information to their team. What that has meant is our CCS entities and our provider entities do not necessarily have to remember which reviewer is reviewing which plan by streamlining one point person for um, each of the areas. It has meant um, a ability to faster respond to any concerns and an ability to resolve any concerns at a faster clip. Our CCS squad has been really awesome and instrumental in working with the CCSs and providers to identify any glitches within um, moving plans forward and just um, troubleshooting any concerns that we've had. 
and overall billing has been successful and there have been very few incidents of um, providers not being able to, comp to be compensated. So for the Central Maryland region, it's been collaboration, clear communication, um, our weekly meetings, and as well as the ongoing weekly meetings, um, independent of the providers with the CCSs for the, with the Central Maryland team to provide that level of technical support. Some of the information that we've heard from our teams as to what has worked is the providers and the CCSs who um, meet with us on Friday have really um, enjoyed the level of collaboration and, and they've all expressed that they feel that each entity understands the role of the other person a little better because they, we're working in such such specific areas and, and in such close knit, knit quarters to get those um, transitions happen. And so what we're seeing as a greater, um, a greater effect is overall the quality of the PCPs that are coming in to the region outside of the plans that are transitioning to LTSS, the quality of the plans and the completeness of the plans are better. Um, moving forward, we will continue as we talk about readiness for the providers who are not yet transitioning into LTSS. We will continue to work with our provider agencies to assess readiness. As you guys know, we have the most amount, the most number of people, the most number of providers, and we will um, continue to schedule ongoing um, check-ins and follow-ups with our providers who may not be ready, but want to be ready and are interested in um, being a part of this pilot group. Group We had our um, provider meeting this morning and a few providers reached out. Um, so again, the word is getting out that this is, is successful and it has been a really positive experience and we will continue to meet with providers, assess the readiness and share what has worked for the other providers. One of the major recommendations and one of the, the biggest successes that we saw was one of our providers worked about six months out with the region uh, in preparation for this go live date when we weren't, they weren't even sure when we had a go live date. Um, they had started preparing all of their PCPs in anticipation of this go live date and it made for a seamless transition of of everyone in their agency. So we will work to continue to encourage the teams to align um, the plans in, not just with our assessed need, but align the plans for LTSS readiness um, for services and in, in the scope that meet the individual needs. So that will reduce the number of clarifications. It will reduce the number of um, revisions that need to be made. And as we move forward, we will continue to provide support from the Central Maryland team to all of our providers and stakeholders. Back to you, Leslie. Thank you very much, Onesto and Bianca. Um, if, there, if there's one thing that you take away from today, it, it should be that we are absolutely here to support everyone in this transition and that we, DDA, we, we want providers to be successful. So that is why we are putting, we have put all of these things in place. We continue to assess our processes because we, we want people to be comfortable. We want you to feel confident in, in this transition. So please, please keep that in mind and remember that as, as, as we move forward. So next slide, please. So one other thing I wanted to discuss briefly before we um, pause for some questions. Um, in January of 2022, the, the previous LTSS Maryland technical group work group was, was reconstituted to a primary work group that focuses on LTSS Maryland operations and implementation. And so that, that relaunch um, of, of the LTSS Maryland work group was kind of the key feedback loop that was needed for continuous learning and, and system process developments. So this just gives you kind of a rundown of the membership of that group. It's co-chaired by um, the Director of Administrative Services with DDA um, and Deputy Director of LTSS Maryland Program Office, Office of Medi Medicaid Provider Services. And then membership 
um, is comprised of a range of stakeholders, key stakeholders per region and service type. We wanted to have a good, a good cross section. So there are 12 providers, which includes, um, includes EAG rep representatives, the early adopter group, three CCS representative agencies, um, the CEO of Max, um, the ARC, and then also SDAN. So um, this has been really instrumental in helping us, you know, move forward in, in this transition as well. Um, and members submit topics for discussion. The state team begins the discussion. Um, we meet, the, the group meets bi-weekly. So that has also been a very uh, positive addition to the, the, our transition process. Okay, so next slide. I am going to check in with Andrea and see if we have any questions thus far. Hello, yes. Um, this one is, <clears throat> excuse me, for Onesta. Um, in a recent meeting through Max Peer Network Group, I believe they stated that services being met with exceptions due to inactive or incorrect PCPs would not be able to be manually billed once the transition into LTSS billing is complete. Is this true? Is there any way for providers to be able to be billed? Oh, sorry. <laughs> is there any way they, providers will be able to be paid if a PCP is causing issues in payment or will services need to be suspended? Thank you for that question. So essentially, um, services do not need to be suspended. If a provider is experiencing um, challenges in the system as far as receiving um, billing exceptions, they should definitely reach out to the regional office and notify us of those challenges that they're experiencing and what the specific um, billing exception is. And we will work to troubleshoot that issue in an expedited manner. Um, and once the issue is resolved, the provider should be able to um, continue with um, billing in the system. Thank you, Onessa. Um, another question, this one's for you, Kathy. For providers who are currently preparing to go live, when, when, are, the, when are the supports, uh, weekly provider meetings to support this process? So it's for providers who are currently preparing to go live, when are the weekly provider meetings to support the process? We don't do weekly provider meetings. We do weekly CCS meetings. We pretty much have the providers reaching out directly to Linda or I, if there's something in particular you need or to Tina as program supervisor, but we don't set um, a group meeting. We meet with the provider as they need assistance. Some other regional offices do provide our weekly meetings, but we have found that the one-on-one -on -one questions have worked out better for us. So if you need something, please call or email me. Thank you. And that's it for the questions at this time. Great, thank you very much, everybody. Um, moving on to the next conversation topic of, of our um, of our webinar today. Um, we want to talk about the role of the coordinators of community services in this readiness process. Uh, next slide, please. We've used the word collaboration quite a few times in this webinar um, and continuing in that, that sort of theme, the role of the CCS in this transition process truly can, cannot be understated. Um, so a few things that are, are crucial for CCS um, as, you know, to aid in this transition, you know, maintaining a calendar PCP dates, you know, with completion timelines for caseloads, um, making sure you, there's adequate time allocated to review and develop each PCP. Um, and then, you know, making sure PCPs are submitted a minimum of 20 days prior to the annual plan date as required. Um, so as to, to kind of summarize, CCSs must be organized, timely, and, and good and, and, and efficient communicators. Um, next slide, please. And, and to speak a little bit more to this, um, I'm going to introduce Nicolette, 
um, the CMRO CCS lead um, and, and more of a subject matter on, on this topic than I am. Um, so she can she can delve a little bit deeper into into the CCS role. Nick. Thank you, Leslie. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in addition to um, a CCS's essential skills that they should have in preparation for this and for all PCPs is just like Leslie noted, is to be organized, timely, and be good communicators. They should be clear on what's needed and by when. Um, and in addition to maintaining a calendar, um, continue to track those PCPs up until they're approved. So follow up with the reviewers once a PCP is submitted and it's in clarification request for five days. Um, and as needed, contact the CCS support for any troubleshooting issues. Utilizing the Go Live playbook includes the CCS support Go Live checklist. And this is really helpful. It was developed to assist in this transition specifically, um, but moving forward, it could be utilized in, uh, on ongoing. Um, so when you're working on any plans that are slated to go live, it is important to remember that if an approved PCP date has a date that coincides with the go live date and it doesn't contain a provider or a provider acceptance, they'll have to complete a revised PCP um, to add the provider at, to the DSA and obtain any necessary service referral acceptance. If we're in the 90 day window of an annual, then the CCS will be completing an annual accordingly. Our goal is to minimize clarification requests, provider billing errors and service interruptions. Remember all services require pre-authorization so timely submission and approval is essential. Authorization is provided through an approved and current PCP and the readiness checklist was developed to assist in this transition. Some essential tasks uh, include verifying that the participant is enrolled in the correct waiver. This could be found under the current enrollment section of a participant's profile and it should match the program type of a PCP. Demographics are correct, such as their address, their date of birth, spelling of a person's name. The verify, they have to verify the start date and the effective date of a plan. So there shouldn't be any gaps in between plans. Um, and verify that the language and the outcomes and goals are consistent with the service implementation plans and ensure that they're person-centered focused. Any risks that are identified in the HRST court orders, behavioral plans, nursing care plans are all in indicated in the person-centered plan. In addition to the service referrals, CCS should ensure that the calculations are entered correctly for all months. They'll utilize the DSAT and work closely with the provider on this. Also, if there's a month where no service is needed, it should be indicated in the plan why there is no need for services in that month. Follow up to ensure that the provider acceptance referral is completed within five days. If not, follow up with the provider again. Again, this is a team effort. Um, ensure that the provider reviewed, understood, and agreed the service referral as well. Supportive documentation is essential. So ensure that the HRST is current and reviewed by a clinical nurse if the score is above three or higher. The DSAT aligns with the DSA, the signature pages, the SIP, the outcome, et cetera. Documents must be reviewed by the CCS to ensure that they're completed accurately to prevent these clarifications. And if dedicated supports are needed, ensure that those supportive documentation for the increase, increased need is uploaded and included in the plan. Again, we're looking to reduce, minimize clarifications. Review and understand DDA policies and guidance for requesting dedicated support hours. Again, this ties into bullet point three. Review and understand the differences between dedicated hours and residential PCIS add-on hours. And then the last two bullet points are also to verify the medical assistance site number as we were uh, requesting earlier and ensure that the medical assistance site number is for that location. 
Um, they should ensure that it's captured accurately in the DSA section of the PCP and the correct address must be selected. Utilize that MA number when looking for the provider under the DSA. Um, that'll help prevent any error when locating and including that provider. We wanna make sure that an incorrect address isn't selected. If the incorrect address generates in the search, this is an indication that it may be the incorrect MA number. So for example, if the MA ends in 00 for a specific licensed site, and that's not a service that's provided in the community like personal supports, that's an indication that it's incorrect. Any site specific service will not end in 00. So that is um, it's a, just something to be mindful of. Um, and it would help support. If you're unsure and the provider is unsure, contact DDA. We're, we're happy to clarify um, and assist with assuring it's the correct site number. And of course, again, after CCS works with their supervisor and the provider is applicable, contact your region CCS support squad to assist with any of the aforementioned. It's a team effort and we request that you include the provider in any of the follow-ups so that we can work collaboratively. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolette. Uh, next slide, please. Andrea, do we have any additional questions at, at this point? Sorry, I was muted. Um, we do. Um, Nicolette, I think this one is for you. When completing a PCP, which has respite services, how are the services addressed with flexibility? For example, if a client does not utilize the respite in the month or date on the PCP, but chooses a different date, will the services still be available or billable? So it's essential to select each month um, and this allows for flexibility um, so that's a simple answer make sure you select every month okay that is the only question right now great thank you very much Nicolette mm -hmm. thanks Andrea Okay, we're going to now pivot just a little bit and discuss um, some of the most common post go live exceptions that that we've been seeing. So to discuss that a little bit more in depth, I'm going to turn things over to Brianna Shaughnessy, who is the a health policy analyst um, with Medicaid provider services. So Brianna. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brianna Shaughnessy. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I wanted to discuss some of the most common uh, post go live exceptions that you may experience after you start billing. Um, there's a few most common ones. You see it on the slide here, provider not authorized, site not, site not authorized, and anything that has to do with exceeding authorization or units. An exception is not a system defect, but rather an indicator that there's something wrong with the billing entry, PCP, or participant eligibility that is preventing billing from going through. Without LTSS, these, exception, these billing entries would go to MMIS and just to come back rejected due to a conflict with one of the issues. This gives you the opportunity to correct the discrepancy and submit a clean claim to MMIS. The most common provider resolvable exceptions have been surrounding provider site not authorized and provider client exceeding the authorization exceptions. Next slide, please. So for the two that I wanted to highlight, that's most, most common. One is site not authorized for the service with no other exceptions involved. That means you're listed on the PCP for that data service and for that service type, but that site is not found. Uh, you should confirm against the PCP that you have the correct site number. Um, if you, you made a billing error and you selected the wrong site, 
simply delete the service and resubmit under the correct type. If, however, you know you build for the right site, you need to contact the CCS and RO to uh, look at the, at the PCP and see if a revised PCP is necessary. Uh, another exception combination is provider not authorized and site not authorized. That means you're not listed on the PCP that's active at this time. So you should confirm um, which, if you're supposed to be billing at this time. It could be that the PCP for that uh, service, it was end dated, um, no hours were listed in that month, or you're billing for the wrong service type. Um, again, if you believe your billing entries are absolutely correct, and that please contact the CCS for clarification and assist it, and assistance in revising the PCP if indicated. Uh, next slide, please. Now I want to talk about some general exception resolution. Check the PCP to make sure you're billing correctly. Many exceptions happen because the wrong service or site was billed. Please view the DDA authorized services report in provider portal to check the authorization. You're going to be looking at the provider number, the site, and the service type. If the service or site was billed in error, again, simply discard and resubmit with the correct information. Again, otherwise, please reach out to the CCS. Some services, in addition, some services have a daily or weekly limit. This is a service specific limitation. Providers should be aware of those limits and adjust any services that violate those rules. For example, meaningful day services should not exceed eight hours in a day or 40 hours a week combined across all meaningful day services. If you come across that exception, just please edit or discard the services according to that authorization. Uh, next slide, please. As far as provider has exceeded exceptions, you can either be fully or partially over the limit. Please review the DDA authorized services report to check the authorization um, at how many units you've already billed and the remaining balance. Um, services over the authorization limit cannot be paid. Please reach out to the CCS if a revised PCP is necessary. Uh, this would be due to an increased support need or a misunderstanding when the PCP was approved. Changes to the service intensity needs to be authorized and approved in the PCP before an increase in services uh, will be allowed. Um, next slide, any questions? There are no questions showing up right now. Okay. And if you do have any questions, uh, please reach out to the ISS desk. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, let's see, I think this one is for Brianna. Okay. Um, all right. We have found that it is difficult to get an easy list of the LTSS exceptions without comparing several different reports. They don't appear on the provider portal claims report except on the day of submission. So far, these pending claims seem to only be visible as participant initials, EVV reports that covers their service date. Are we missing an easier way to track this information so we can get more claims corrected and completed? So the provider portal claims report is only for services that have fully passed all exceptions. You're not going to find anything that is pending an exception in those reports. Uh, the provider portal claims report means everything's clean and is ready and approved to go to MMIS for payment. Um, meanwhile, the DDA, DDA services rendered report will pull all DDA services, whether they're EVV or non-EVV, and you'll be able to see all the services that you've billed, regardless of their claim status, and you'll be able to find the exceptions that way. The EVV services rendered report will only pull personal supports and personal supports enhanced, and and it's regardless of it. So basically, if you want to pull everything, you need to do, use the DDA services rendered report. Thank you, Brianna. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? 
Uh, yes, there is one coming in now. Okay. Um, oh, the same person uh, who had the question had commented, currently we only have personal supports enabled. Okay. Um, yeah, so it should be in that report. I do believe there is a bug that's being investigated on one report that might be the one, um, and that's being investigated right now. But for it should, but those services should still appear on the DDA EVV services rendered report. Make sure you have all the default settings on. Um, make sure you're searching for all the services. And if you have any issues and you're still not pulling somebody up, please email my team. Um, it's the ISAS help desk uh, email, and that should uh, I'll and that should um, I'll either myself or one of my teammates will look into it if, if you still have issues and you can't find the services. And they say thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Any other questions, or are we get? I think that's it for now. All righty. All right, then I would say go to the next slide. Um, and I think Leslie, take back over. Great, thank you very much, Brianna. So you um, will see, um, if, you, if you pull the, the handout down, you'll be able to access all of the resources we've been discussing throughout this webinar. Um, the links are, are provided for you in the handout. Um, so it's kind of a, a, a summary of, of each of these. So the DDA will require providers to complete the provider go live readiness checklist to verify that, that they are prepared for a successful transition to the LTSS Maryland DDA module. And, and each provider will validate successful completion of all the readiness activities that we just, we've discussed by submitting the completed provider go live readiness checklist to their assigned regional office. Um, the, the provider readiness checklist, which is, as we've, we've talked about, a checklist of essential tasks that each provider should complete, sign and submit to the DDA to confirm that your organization has completed all the steps necess necessary for a smooth transition into LTSS Maryland DDA module. We also have linked the CCS support checklist, um, and this is a checklist of essential tasks that the CCS must perform to ensure that each PCP has been completed, um, the provider providers have accepted their service referral, and the PCP has been submitted to the regional office in a timely manner for final review and uh, approval. Um, then the last uh, link listed, resource listed, is the LTSS um, DDA Provider Upload API. Um, and I'm going to let Brianna speak a little bit more on this. Hi, ba back again. Um, so there is documentation available for providers if they would like to use the provider upload for their billing entries. To get set up, you will need to reach out to the LTSS help desk to get your account uh, ready for yourself and a few individuals who will have access to it. Please be, be sure to view the content linked on this slide as well. It provides valuable information for what information and setup will be expected when you use this API. It also provides um, information on how to access a test site for you to practice the upload and verify that that information um, is successfully uploadable. And that's all I have on that one. Thanks, Brianna. And, and I, I forgot to mention as well that the top of the list of the resources is the LTSS DDA module playbook, which is a, a very, very valuable resource for, for all things um, LTSS Maryland. Um, we're right at one o'clock. I just want to check in with Andrea and see if any additional questions have come through. Right now, we do not have any additional questions. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to then turn things back over to Caroline. Leslie, and thank you to all of our presenters and panelists today for sharing this important information. This concludes our second session of our LTSS Maryland Lunch and Learn series. 
Our next session is going to be held on June 23rd at 12 p.m. And it's going to focus on what it takes for successful IT integration and staff training. On behalf of the Developmental Disabilities Administration, we thank you for your participation today. We hope you all have a wonderful day.